Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. Veteran Destiny players may remember the Season of Dawn. This is still to this day a season that I have a lot of fond memories of, not least because it brought back Saint-14. And God, what a time it was, but also it brought us one of Destiny's most incredible and persistent mysteries, the Corridors of Time. We accessed the corridors thanks to Osiris' sundial, a device on Mercury that would allow us to traverse to different timelines and realities. It's within these corridors that we originally found Saint-14. But we also found something else. If you traversed a long and meandering pathway through the corridors of time, you would eventually be brought to a chamber with a tomb at its center. This tomb was in itself a remarkable find. But as soon as we approached it, we were always teleported back. Reaching the actual tomb itself would be one of the most important and pressing challenges of that season, but reach it we did. Community members managed to decipher an even longer route through the corridors, assembling information together over hundreds of hours in just the space of about a week, cracking the code, and finally unlocking the secret of the corridors of time. The final pathway was plotted, and when we reached the tomb, it would change everything that we knew, and would force us to ask fundamentally unsettling questions. As it turned out, this grave at the heart of the corridors of time was our own. Saint-14, as we approached the grave, could even be heard giving a eulogy, implying that there was an echo attached to this grave from some point in the future. It went something like this. Thank you for coming. We've gathered here today to celebrate the life of my mentor, my inspiration. They called him Crota's End. The High Kingslayer. The young wolf. Hero of the Red War. The man, the man who avenged Kate Six. He had a hundred times, I cannot recall. And he died doing what he does best. Defending the last city of humanity. Ages ago, he saved my life, and then inspired me to save myself. I am glad that he did, because travel held us. He is gone. And there is no one to save us now. On the day we met, I decided I would follow his example. I'm still trying. I've marked this grave with one of his favorite weapons, shattered in that final confrontation. It used to be mine. All who find what we've left here. Please, leave it be. Unless... Unless you're still on there somewhere. You've performed miracles before. In which, in which case, take it. And come back to us. And we'll kill. This was our funeral. With all our honorifics, all our titles, and with a moment of terrible calamity on the horizon. Now, as the Witness's forces have claimed victory, and as it has entered the Traveler, our universe faces potential ruin. We have been called upon countless times to stand against the minions of the Witness and those that would bring our people ruin. Now we stand against our greatest foe, and we know that we shall face it within the heart of the Traveler itself. 
This presents the very real question of whether or not the funeral speech given by Saint-14 will be a moment we experience within the final shape itself, and whether there will be a point at which we, unfortunately, fall victim to the witness. If we are going to face the witness, this is entirely possible, and it would spell an end to our relatively short life as a guardian, representing the first time in our 10 or 11 years when we would finally have met our match. The power of the witness is something that needs to be properly expressed here. It supersedes all of the enemies that we've faced thus far, including, of course, its own disciples, from Callus to Nezarek to Rulk. It is evidently greater than the hive gods like Savathun or Oryx or Zivuorath. It is a greater power than the stronger worm gods such as Yul and certainly the lesser worm gods such as Zol. There is, frankly, no parallel to the Witness that we have faced so far. In the act of facing the Witness, it seems entirely possible that we shall be bested in combat. This is especially true given that the Witness has been able to spend an undisclosed amount of time within the Pale Heart of the Traveler. With such time, it has clearly been able to fortify and mold the landscape to its liking. It has also been able to build up a significant presence of its own forces within the Pale Heart, and has brought in new subjugators to augment them. This is also to say nothing of the power of the Witness itself, and how it might have access to or have absorbed new abilities from being at the heart of the Traveler. We have not seen the Witness since it entered the Traveler, and whatever it has become is unknown to us. It could have become something far more dangerous. So again, it's worth noting, the whole idea that we could just die isn't just plausible, it's a more real possibility than it's ever been. A final confrontation with the Witness will inevitably render an answer as to whether or not we'll die, but the question then clearly becomes, if we do die, how would we return? After all, the very nature of destiny implies that the story goes on after the campaign. If you ask me, there are a few possibilities we need to explore in the process of answering this question. But if we were to return to life anywhere within the world of destiny, it's not impossible for it to be within the heart of the Traveler. The Traveler itself as well as the Light are forces of creation and chaos. If life springs from the Traveler's wake, then it's not at all impossible that we would be able to somehow return if we were within its own bounds. The power within the heart of the Traveler might be a compelling possibility for our resurrection, and I imagine some people will be tempted to point to another potential example of this that might already have happened, Cade 6. Now, to be really clear, that's throwing a hand grenade's worth of speculation into the discourse, and I don't think we should immediately assume anything. Whilst a spontaneous resurrection of one of the Light's greatest champions is possible from the Light alone, there are also other possible reasons for Cade's resurrection, and they get presented directly to us in the lore of the Season of the Wish. Chief amongst them, Riven. At a certain point in time, Riven of a Thousand Voices and Crow had a conversation. It's recorded in the lore. Riven, at the time, was using her powers to psychically mask herself and present herself as Marasov, Crow's sister. That conversation appears in the Unforeseen Consequences ship, and it reads as follows. He remembers his sister's throne differently. An amalgam of elixni flotsam built from the spoils of war, its great weight suspended from the rafters. A throne Aldrin set ablaze in the wake of losing her, his first step down a forsaken path. Crow lays a hand on the throne before him. It is empty and ponderous, silhouetted by distant nebulae and cosmic dust. It feels smooth, too smooth. It was here that I first heard news of your death, calls a familiar voice from behind him. He turns to see his sister striding down the hall. Mara takes her place beside him and gazes out into the far reaches of space. Did you mourn for me? Fro asks. I did, his sister replies. She is silent for a moment. And 
I regret what I did to you. The manipulation, the subtle coercion, none of it went the way I intended. Crow follows her gaze out into the endless void. <laughs> I know what that's like. Remorse and recriminations, Mara says absently. She turns her eyes toward him. If you could go back, alter the course of your history, what would you change? He can't help but laugh. <laughs> Where to begin? Crow muses with a smirk. It fades soon enough. Cade, he whispers. Mara raises an eyebrow. Oh? Before then, I could have taken a different road. But once I pulled that trigger, he shakes his head. Everything else I can set right, but not that. I just wish I could tell him I shouldn't have done it. I see, Mara murmurs. Her eyes shine in the starlight. Crow sighs and rolls his shoulders back. I should get going. Vanguard's waiting on my report. We all have our obligations, I suppose. Don't I know it? Crow nods as he heads down the hall. He pauses at the portal to the Dreaming City and glances back at Mara. Ringed by the distant nebulae, she shimmers like a mirage on desert sands. And then Crow is gone. See you soon. Mara's voice echoes across the empty chamber as the illusion fades. Oh, brother mine. So Crow might have unknowingly wished for Cade Six to return within the heart of the Traveler. This isn't definitively what happened, but it is to say that there are more possibilities than just the one. We cannot say for certain that Cade is an example of how we might be resurrected if we were to die at the Witness's hands. Equally, we can't say that he isn't. Wish magic might have had something to do with his return. But we can't know that for sure until we see it. Bungie loves to present us with their red herrings in their writing, so it's not at all impossible that this is just a weak riven toying with Crow. After all, she even admitted that she didn't have much power left, and that making the wish to follow the witness might be all that she was capable of. Resurrecting someone within the heart of the Traveler. I don't believe it to be impossible, but I would state that it is unlikely, even though there are implications that wish magic may have been used here. Again, red herrings. I won't put my finger on this being the answer, and I won't put my finger on the opposite being true either just yet. I would simply present this as a note of saying that there are possibilities, and in all fairness, I thought I should raise this. There is, of course, one other possibility that I wanted to raise, and this brings us to the heart of the matter. To the heart of many matters, in fact. From here on out, I need you to understand, what I'm saying is strictly speculative, and I also want you to hear me as I say that this is not going to be the last time we speak of this subject. It is about to be one of the more important topics we will have discussed in the history of Destiny's lore. In truth, I've been waiting for months to cover this topic in detail, touching up on the bits and pieces that I didn't know, and seeing what everyone else thought about it, trying to digest different perspectives. Soon, I will be ready to put more answers to this particular topic. To put it very simply, what if something greater than us intervenes to resurrect us upon our death? Some of you may have heard a story, long ago. A story that came to us from Luna. I am of course referring to the Book of Unveiling. This law book is one that I covered in the past a lot. It was revealed to us week by week and its pages were revelatory. It's clear that it's a religious text in nature and might be from the propaganda-filled perspective of the darkness, I made as much of a note at the very time when this was revealed. It seems that the actual author is still unknown, and whilst it would be easy to 
believe that this was indeed the witness that gave us this text, there are subtle clues that hint that it may have been someone different. That is, however, a story for another time. For now, the abridged version of the story told near the beginning of this law book goes as follows. Before time began, before the universe was violently born, before all that has ever been, there was a garden. Within this garden, there existed two figures, a gardener and a winnower. The gardener seeded varied and fertile life, watching it grow towards the sun. And at the end of every day in metaphor, as dusk would fall, the winnower would wait and would cut away the chaff. For a long time, the gardener and the winnower have been discussed in relation to the light and the dark. Their struggle and the eventual conflict that brought the end of the flower game and the order that the winnower supposedly saw within the universe brought us to a strange stage, if it can be believed, where the universe bloomed and blossomed for the first time and life was brought to the world. As these beings have been discussed in relation to the light and dark, some have even questioned whether they might be representative of the Traveler and the Witness. This is a question that I completely intend to explore, and one that I do not believe is appropriate to answer now. It would be a tangent of all tangents. This is a video topic that I want to cover, but it may take even longer than simply the length of this video to talk about this. There is a lot we need to look into. For now, I would simply pose this simple idea. What if we are resurrected thanks to the intervention of a mythical figure, namely the gardener? Now to be really clear, this idea goes very far out there, but I'm sure there are others who sit within the Destiny Law community that might speculate the same thing. And to be even more clear, this would be one of the most incredibly important moments in the whole of Destiny's timeline since the beginning. I really do mean the beginning with that, by the way. There are major questions as to whether the Gardener is actually the Traveler, and there are also conflicting sources implying different things about the nature of these two figures, or I suppose the potential nature of these two figures. Some sources, such as the Book of Unveiling, imply that the intervention of the Gardener was the cause for the creation of the universe as it is, one filled with chaos and potentially pain and suffering, but also one of life. That might mean that an intervention like this would make a great degree of sense. In other instances, such as when Clovis Bray was communing through dreams in his death with a figure that was either the gardener or the traveler, it was made clear that intervention was something which was not typically done by this figure, and there is a notion that needs to be made that it has always remained distant. Even characters such as Commander Zavala have noted this, and have even cursed it to this day. There is an important hour of need ahead of us. There is perhaps a moral compass that governs this individual. Maybe it would keep us from having an intervention from them. Maybe it would be the reason for their intervention. Regardless, in this most pressing of moments, at the end of all things, I believe it would be an adequate place for such a moral praxis to be tested, and in these circumstances, it would be wise for some to make an exception so that there might at least be a chance to avert calamity so universal that it would snuff everything out. If there is one being, one power within the universe capable of rewriting death into life, it would be based in the light. After all, this has happened before. Every time we are resurrected by our own ghosts, we're reminded that we have been visited by a power with the ultimate ability to refuse death's own grasp. If our ghosts contain even an echo of that power, one can only imagine what might lie within the heart of the Traveler, where the light is plentiful. Mark my words, this is not the last time we'll be talking about this topic. As we approach Final Shape, will be placed on a collision course with these questions. Questions so fundamental to the universe of destiny that answers to them are almost certain to be approached. I don't know if we'll reach the point where we need to test any of these ideas, but I think death is a certain possibility. 
if we are to die, perhaps this will lead to the eulogy that Saint gave us. And maybe it will also bring us to a point of our potential return. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. Do you believe that we are fated to die in this expansion? All that being said, if you enjoyed the video, go ahead and simply leave a like. And remember that you can hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. Also, a kind and wholehearted thank you to all of those of you who have been enjoying my new YouTube Shorts content. I'm having a ton of fun making it and bouncing around the various topics week by week, day by day. It also gives me a lot of levity when it comes to everything in Destiny because it means I can step outside of whatever's being covered in a particular season. And that feels lovely. I hope you guys enjoy them. I will keep making them. My plan is to continue doing five to seven of them every week. All that being said, as per usual, know that your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Adastra. I'll see you, Starside.